live. Let me put my phone off to the side where it won't distract me when everybody starts texting me like they do sometimes. Um, we're back. We're, it is Monday, October 30th, and um, it's time for us to have our Bible study. So let's start. Let's start with the prayer. <clears throat> Father, I thank you so much that people spend time with us for these Bible studies. I ask you to bless us and be with us right now as we go into your word uh, in Romans chapter 5. And I ask you to give us understanding of the things that we're studying. And I ask you to be with us and draw in the people you would have to be with us here today. Joe is here. Amen. Amen. Joe's here. Hey, Joe, you win. You're the first person to be here tonight. Praise God. It's good to see you. So we're in Romans um, 9. And, and um, Paul is talking about some kind of bonuses. Hey, hey, Liz and Gary, it's good to see you all. Some bonuses, sort of, to uh, having Jesus as our Lord. And I'm going to quote those. And then we'll get into nine. No, I was just trying to remember, uh, Joe. Um, where we went. We saw a place. We were driving out to Colin's house, Sean's uh, younger brother's house, to watch um, uh, his and his wife's baby, uh, Lila. And we were on our way there, and we saw a place, and I thought it was the place we went to. So if it was, we're going to go back and remember the good meal we had. But um, no, I don't. Hey, Michael, it's good to see you. So, um, Paul said, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then he goes into a bonus, kind of much more than, and that's where we start today, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So it's, it's even better than just being saved, but being saved from God's wrath. Paul writes much more than. And I love the way that Paul often says, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, and that's not all. There's more. By doing so, he communicates the richness and generosity of the Lord. Lord, Some of the richness and generosity of the Lord. Hey, Keith and Stacy, it's good to see you all. Um, much more than, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We should never discount the importance of the shed blood of Jesus. I don't think anybody willingly does that, but I think we just kind of neglect to dwell on it. And I think by doing that, we cheat ourselves out of some of the um, benefits of being aware of um, all the things that Jesus' blood poured out for us, um, meant for us. And so I'm going to quote from Albert Barnes's notes on the Bible. And, um, and I think um, it's a good quote for us. Let me go down to that. So here's this quote. The fact that we are purchased by his blood and sanctified by it renders us sacred in the eye of God, bestows a value on us proportionate to the worth of the price of our redemption, and is a pledge that he will keep what has been so dearly bought. I mean, look at, look at that middle clause. Well, first off, to, to think that God, God considers us to be sacred is a beautiful concept, isn't it? But then we have been, we've been bestowed with a value that is proportionate to the worth of the price of our redemption. I do a teaching for people who, um, who feel like they have no value. And like in a counseling room, 
I have a lot of counseling area back there. I often have a chance to do this. Sometimes in, in discipleship as well, and sometimes those two get blurred. But um, there are a lot of people that believe that they have no intrinsic value as humans. And it's because of things they've been told their whole life or, or whatever, messages that have gone into our souls. And the reality is that the scripture teaches that we were bought at a price. It says that in 1 Corinthians 6, the last two verses of the whole chapter, I think it's 19 and 20, and, and the price of anything equals the purchase price. So, so what somebody's willing to pay for it, and I'll, I'll say, what kind of car do you have outside? What kind of truck? And they'll tell me, and I don't know anything about cars and trucks, really. I know how to drive, but I don't really care much about vehicles. But um, a lot of people do, but I don't. And I'll say, I can tell you what your car is worth. And I'll say, how, how can you do that? And I said, whatever, you can get somebody to pay for it. That's what it's worth. And the truth is that the highest price ever paid for anything was paid for us. Jesus spent his life, spent his, spent his blood, spent his re, his, his uh, connectivity to the Father for a period of time, became sin and was separated from him all for us. The price is astronomically high. So our personal value having been purchased and that price was laid down to purchase us, that is what your value is. Now normally, how do we do that? We do that by physical things. We do that by our appearance. We do that by our performance. We do that by someone, some human's opinion of our appearance and our performance. But I don't think that's a valid measurement. I really don't. Because of the reality, um, even on the earth, it's like if you can get uh, 20 bucks for that car, it's a $20 car. If you can get 2000 or 10000 or 100000 for it, that's the value of that car. You know, and so so the rules of supply and demand don't actually work here uh, because the price was paid in 33 AD for everyone who ever receives him. So like Albert Barnes says, and I quote, the fact that we are purchased by Jesus' blood and sanctified by it renders us sacred in the eye of God, bestows a value on us proportionate to the worth of the price of our redemption, to what Jesus spent for it, and is a pledge that he's going to keep what he has so dearly bought. What a beautiful quote from, from Albert Barnes. The term justified literally means to be rendered innocent. But it also, in this case, implies friendship with God. Now, how do we know that? Well, let's look at the next verse, the next verse, and see how it begins. The next verse says, remember the tenses of these verses are very important. It's going to be very important, especially as I'm writing my text for uh, Romans chapter 6. As we get into chapter 6, tenses are going to be very important. The Holy Spirit has a great command of the language, and he writes exactly what he wants to say. Oops. Huh. Accidentally cut a line out of my text. That ain't good. Um, so this is the next verse. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his son's life. Look at that. We were enemies. And we're not enemies anymore. And we're not nothings. We're valuable members of his family. So we're his friends now. The idea of reconciliation is a huge idea. And one which is not mentioned enough in the body of Christ. Reconciliation has to do with drawing near again, which means that prior to that, we were divided. And so man was together with God in the garden. 
man's sin put division between him and God and Jesus' death and us participating in that through salvation has reconciled us or brought us back together with him. Now remember, it doesn't really matter if we don't feel like we're close to him. We are close to him. Why? Because we've been reconciled. When we were enemies, we were also, past tense, reconciled. So the moment we were born again, we were brought near to him again. And our emotions sometimes just take a while to catch up. And sometimes our emotions are driven by ideas of the strongholds in our souls that tell us that we're still not good enough or that God uh, doesn't love us because of whatever it is we think or we say or we do sometimes. But the truth is that past tense, the moment we were born again, we were brought near to God, whether we feel like he's close or not. Now, I think it's a good prayer. And it's not in my notes, so it won't be in the book that I eventually write out of Romans. But I think it's a good prayer to pray. Maybe I'll add it. It's a good prayer to pray to invite God to allow you to feel his nearness. And there are times when it happens. I had a friend, someone from my past um, in New Orleans, who uh, the Lord had me wake up one morning and I asked him what he wanted to do today and he said to find this friend. So I dug around and called people who knew her married last name and where what town she lived in. I was able to find her in the phone book that she used to be able to see online when people had landlines. And the Lord had me call this person. So I called her up. And um, when I she last knew me, I wasn't saved. And I was just as ungodly as could be. And so I had to catch her up. And guess what? I'm saved. And not only that, I'm in ministry. And then I said, what's going on with you? And she had gotten and knelt down that day because she was uh, an, an active alcoholic. And her husband um, basically said, deal with this or we can't live together anymore. He was tired of seeing her come home sick or drunk or whatever it was. And so she knelt down and asked God to send somebody to help. And I'm in North Texas. This person's still back in Louisiana. And the Lord had me look her up, what put her on my mind and told me to, to call her. So I did. Um, and she was talking about how distant she felt from God because for practicing the sin of alcoholism. And so I asked her to pray and ask God to, to let her feel his nearness. We talked about this verse or another one like it. Um, I know that there's a scripture that says, draw near to God in James and he'll draw near to you. I think it's in James. And um, this is another version of that drawing near is to ask God to... Um, to let us feel that. And so she did. And a day or two later, she sent me an email and talked about how she could actually sense his embrace because her husband works overnight um, and, and he's gone until the mornings. So she's alone a lot. And that was part of why she was getting drunk so much. Um, we've been reconciled. Most lost people have no idea that is a, a huge gulf between them and God. In fact, most most of them um, don't care. I mean, it, God doesn't uh, mean anything to them and isn't real for them, but he is real. And because he's real, um, it's a real gulf. There is a big distance between us and God when we were lost. Some presume he's there for them because the idea brings them comfort, but it's not true. Romans 5.10 again says, For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. The only way to have that huge gulf removed is to participate in the death of God's son. When we do that, we are, quote, saved by his life, unquote. Isn't that beautiful? God has given us a way. 
I mean, I'll, I'll tell you when I was when I was um, about to be born again. <coughs> the guy Dan Ledford that was trying to lead me to the Lord, lead me to a salvation plan, uh, a salvation prayer. Um, he said, "Don't you want Jesus' blood to wash away all your sins?" By then, I was aware that I had sin, and I admitted I had sin. And I looked at him, and I was so pragmatic. And I said, man, that blood was shed in 33 AD. It's been dried up and blown away a long time. And he almost pulled his hair out. <laughs> I made him crazy. But the reality is, is that there's a way that we can ask Jesus to be our Lord. And we're brought spiritually back to 33 AD and the blood that pours down from the cross because Jesus allowed himself to be scourged and Jesus allowed himself to have a crown of thorns put on his head and Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to the cross and be you know, stuck with a spear. That blood washes away our sin whenever it is in, fu in the future. We come to Christ. For me, it was 1986. That blood had been poured out, you know, 1953 years before. It still washed away my sins. The only way to have that, to have the forgiveness of sins, to have a distance removed and be reconciled with God is to participate in that death and praise him that God gave us a way we can participate in his son's death, burial, and resurrection. And we're going to go through that in depth in Romans 6. I think it's beautiful. And so now Paul, in verse 11, has another, and not only that, there's still more. So not just reconciliation, and not just being saved, but there's more. And not only that. Can you imagine reading this for the first time in Rome and learning more about what happened to you today that you asked Jesus to be a Lord? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Another and there's more. I'm going to quote a fairly long quote from a different commentary that I like from John Gill's exposition of the Bible. I would, Stacy asked, in case you can't see this, and the people that watch this on YouTube can't, but Stacy asked, how would you answer your question about God's blood if someone asked you today? I would do it a little bit like what I just did. I would talk about the fact that it was shed originally in 33 AD. And when we get to Romans 6, I'll, I'll be going more into depth about this, Stacy. Um, but that might be a week or two or a month or next week. Who knows? But um, the, thing, the thing is, is that we have to look at it with two sets of eyes. We have to look at it with our, our earthborn eyes. Like I did when I told them that blood was shed a long time ago in 33 AD. That's an earthly look at it. That's that's a, a, a view of, of blood being shed in 33 AD that is based on my human concept of time, of not being able to go back in time and like experientially, uh, physically go back in time and all that sort of thing. So that that is... Um, that is a truth. And, and in, in a physical sense, it did dry up, right? It was in a pool on the ground at the base of the cross. And when they got up and pulled his body off that cross, um, the blood dried on the cross and it dried on the ground. Um, so in, in a sense of human time, as time marches on after so many hours, it was it was, it was dried up. But we also have the opportunity to look at this with spiritual eyes. And to do that, we have to take into account that God is not limited by time or space. So I could be in, back then I was in Mandeville, Louisiana, and, and the, the, um, 
the sacrifice was in Jerusalem, right outside of Jerusalem, right, in 33 AD. And it was 1986 in Mandeville, Louisiana. So we had time and space differences there. But for God, all points on the timeline from the time he created the earth until the time he ends the earth, they're all simultaneous for him. He sees all of that as now, right? And so we have to think as much as we can with human limitations. Um, it, will admit, it, it symbolizes life. It symbolizes the transfer of life. So she says, what would I say about the dried up blood? And so the blood symbolizes his sacrifice of dying. It, it symbolizes a lot and it represents a lot. Hi, hey, Donna, it's good to see you. Um, but, but the truth is, we're going to see in Romans six, and we're going to that we're going, we're going to be when we confess Jesus as our Lord. We're going to see in uh, I think Second Corinthians, uh, we're going to see that when we confess Jesus as Lord, we were placed into Jesus. We were baptized into Christ, and it says we were baptized into His death, and His death was the death of shed blood, right? So. So in a spiritual sense, and I don't know how mechanically this works because I'm earthbound, and, but I can wrap my head around it from the standpoint of God not being earthbound, that when in 1986 I confess Jesus as Lord, and whenever each of you confess Jesus as Lord, spiritually, we were all united in Christ on that instant that he was hanging on the cross and he died. And we were in him, it says, when we were buried with him. And it, we were in him, the scripture says, when he rose, we rose with him. And when he ascended, the scripture says, we ascended with him. That's a spiritual issue. And we have three parts. We have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. And my body can't f understand completely how physical blood that dried up sometime in A.D. 33, in 1986, washed away my sins. And if you really want to pretzelize your brain, pretzelize your noodle, think about First John uh, 1, 9, that says the blood of Christ in the present ongoing tense continually washes away whatever sin we come up with as we go between the time we're saved in the time we physically die. It's still cleansing, Stacy, And, and, and um, the only way I can see that is to look at it from as best I can, a spiritual viewpoint. And I'll tell you, lost people definitely can't get this. Because the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 2, I believe, that these things are spiritually discerned. They don't make sense to lost people. They're foolishness to them. But it's spiritually discerned things. They make sense to us. And that's how I that's how I teach it. That's how I would teach it here in this Bible study. That's how I teach it there. I would teach that in the front end of a truck. I would teach that wherever I am because I believe it's the truth. Do I do I understand the, the mechanics of all that? No. I don't. I think when we get to heaven, we're no longer uh, bound by a physical body and the limitations of gravity and time and air and all that stuff. We're going to see it and it's going to go, oh, that's so logical, you know, but right now that's that's the best I can do. But the Apostle Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to write these things, especially in Romans 6. And he says some things in, in Galatians 3. Um, he also says in Galatians 3 that we're baptized into Jesus' death. And so we were. So we were placed into that. And at that point, spiritually, we came into contact with not the dried up blood of Jesus, but the freshly flowing blood of Jesus washed us clean. We died with him. And if we could wrap our heads with that, in, in, in that and we can really understand try to understand it the best we can, it becomes harder for me to be tempted. It becomes harder for us to tempt it. So Stacy said, um, I 
just never had anyone ask me that question. I want to know what you would do to help those out here sharing about God and his son Christ. And anytime you have a question like that, Stacy, or anyone else, feel free to ask. This study is meant to be interrupted by good questions. It's meant to be as interactive as the limitations of a Facebook uh, live Bible study can be. And that's the way to do it. And I appreciate that. And, and I'll, I'll just caution and, and comfort you in the fact that I am uniquely weird. And I don't know if anybody will ever ask me that question that I asked Dan Ledford. I just really gave that poor man a run for his money. And and um, because because I'm not dumb and I was I was uh, angry and I was resentful that I had to be saying I was just a booger to him, and, you know, and so it was difficult for him. And he just went, ah, you're driving me nuts, you know, and I laughed because I thought I was winning. But what it was doing was keeping me further. I could have dropped dead, you know, uh, not been saved. It kept me further from the cross. Um, but that night I, I was born again. About 11 o'clock that night I was baptized. Um, and people came back. People came back to church on Sunday night. I, I am. I really am, Stacy. My mom said I was weird. I know I am. I'm different. I know I am. And I have weird questions and weird um, weird thoughts. I mean, I get these thoughts where I think something all the way through. And that's what I did. I thought that through. And I said, how, how can you know, blood that was shed in 33 AD affect me now in 1986? It doesn't make any sense to me. And that it's, you know, in a physical sense, it still doesn't. But in a spiritual sense, it does. It means, to me, it's like perfectly logical. Uh, it is. From from teaching it and studying it and knowing it and, and experiencing it and living it, I don't think weird's a bad thing. I really don't. There's a lot of good, weird people out there. You know, um, Einstein was pretty weird. He thought about stuff from a different perspective than other people. Weird and bad, you know. Um, um, anyway, I, I don't mean to offend you by calling myself weird. Um, and I don't want to be sidetracked. So in Romans 5.11, to recap, it says, Not only that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Yeah, Donna, I'm a human platypus. Um, let me let me quote this long quote out of John Gill's exposition of the Bible, an excellent resource if you want to get a, a, um, one of those resources. What's it called? A commentary, a great commentary. I use it all the time. So here's this long quote. We'll read through it together and milk it dry. Um, something here on, on this verse needs to be understood, John Gill tells us. And which is to be supplied thus. Not only are we saved by his life, by Jesus' life, and from wrath through him, not only are we reconciled to God by his Son, and by the Spirit, not only Christ has died for us while sinners and godly, not only do we glory in tribulations and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, but we also joy in God himself as our covenant God and Father in Christ, as the, as the God of all grace, peace, and salvation, in the purposes of God and his covenant transactions with his son as they are made known in the everlasting gospel in all his providential dispensations which are mercy and truth and in our being of him in Christ and Christ being made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. He's pulling from all over the New Testament and all the blessings of grace we receive from him the glory of which is his due and in his sight and presence and the enjoyment of him. 
I read that, I read that, and I I was sad to confess that I don't typically joy in God. And the reason I don't is because I don't meditate on it and really receive it. So I'm going to be doing that, right? Um, and I have been doing that. And so to really dwell on God and, and all these things, man, paste this out of this Bible study, this quote from John Gill, put it in a word file or something, print it up and go through it. Man, it's a powerful quote, isn't it? And not only that, but we also rejoice with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So think about that, through him. So it's not just that, I mean, I mean, if, if, if you listen to sermons and teachings, you hear this concept that Jesus does something for us. And it's okay, he did it. And now either you participate or you don't. And, and there's other things he does. And either you participate and you don't. But, but what this verse is saying is that Jesus becomes a continuous conduit through whom we interact with the Father. We rejoice in God through Jesus as our conduit of that, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So Jesus becomes, if you will, this spiritual pipeline, and through that pipeline comes nearness to God, reconciliation, restored, near, restored nearness to God through reconciliation, which comes through that pipeline, if you will, the spiritual pipeline, that is Jesus. And from our end, a rejoicing to God goes through Jesus back to the Father. Isn't that powerful? He says, we have now received the reconciliation. And now, receiving is, there's a two-part thing there. One of them is that it gets deposited in our account, in our spiritual account. The other is that we take note of that and we begin to harvest the meaning of it. And that's what the word lambano translated to receive means. It means to benefit from something that we already got. To, to um, in our minds, seize it and make it ours. It would be good for us to actually participate in receiving the reconciliation that Jesus spent so highly so we could be near God again. To not allow Satan to cause us to feel distant from someone that we're right shoulder to shoulder with in the spiritual sense. Ask for that. Ask for the reconciliation. Ask him to let you receive it and enjoy nearness to God here it is, James 4, 8a. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a promise. And this is part of our inheritance. So let's not squander that. Okay? Let's just do it. Donna, I think the same thing. Donna says, laugh and think about what do you do with spare parts to make a platypus. God puts them together and makes a platypus. How about the walrus? Let's give him a mustache and let's give him two big old tusks, you know, and let's make him look a little bit like something. You know, it's weird. If you think about it, that's a very strange critter. And a norwal. A norwal has a big tooth coming out of his head that looks like a horn that he can actually hear with and sense the presence of prey. Strange. It's like a fish version of a unicorn, you know. So now we're in verse 12. And it starts off in the King James. It's wherefore in, in the new King James that I, I use in my study. Um, 
Actually, it was like five different Bibles in my study. Um, but in the, in the New King James, it says, therefore. In the, New King, in the King James, it says, wherefore. And it means something that other than what therefore usually means. It, this comes through the word from, from the Greek word dia, which is used to denote a way something moves through something else. In this case, instead of being a connective device, like therefore usually is, like people could say, uh, therefore, is a, there's a reason that there is therefore, you know, uh, therefore is therefore. So, you know, it connects two ideas. It doesn't connect two ideas to relate them together here. It's a topic shift. And it refers to a technical spiritual conduit of sorts. Paul uses it to signal He's about to discuss the dynamic and how sin spread to all mankind through one's sin, one man's sin, Adam's sin, and how salvation comes through one man, Jesus. So he's he's basically communicated in the letter to the original hearers and to us. Now he's fixing to talk about something else. So we're going to go into that verse. Therefore, and we might we might stop at the end of this verse today. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, you know, God never planned that people would die. I mean, he knew we would. However, through one person sinning, a domino effect occurred through all mankind, infecting every person ever born thereafter, except for Jesus, with sin. He infected all of mankind with sin, and that resulted in the introduction of death to mankind. So that's why Paul writes, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through him, and death through sin. The word world, when he says sin entered the world, is a Greek word Cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S, -S, from which we get the word C-O-S-M-O-S. -S. But listen to what it means. When we think cosmos, we think of um, some some guy um, at the planetarium or some kind of astronomer um, talking about stars and suns and solar systems. That's not what this word means in the Greek. Just as through one man sin entered the cosmos. The word cosmos means orderly arrangement. Meditate on that. So through one man sin entered the orderly arrangement that God put in place. It describes God's perfect order, which characterizes everything he does until it is perverted or twisted by Satan. So when sin entered the world, it brought with it Satan's opposite of God's perfect order. This explains the chaos and disorder and sin rampage that we now see that characterizes the earth every place where God's order isn't celebrated and intentionally practiced. To me, this makes the mess of the earth make sense. It still grieves me, but I understand. When, when there was order that was placed, when God spoke everything into place, and it was order, and then Satan brought in this chaos and disorder, and that reigns in much of the, the earth today, then I can understand, even though I can't really wrap my head around, what um, Arab terrorists did a couple of weeks ago in Israel. Well, that's chaos and disorder and, ramp and a rampage of sin, isn't it? And, and so that's a place... It's, it's a satanic thing for them to come in, kill people that they worked for, uh, torture people while their kids or their parents watched, 
uh, do all the stuff they did, S slit babies' throats, and cut their heads off, all that stuff, just just raping and pillaging and and just uh, laughing and bragging, and, and it also explains why people back home in Gaza celebrated and danced and gave praise to whatever it is they worship, Allah, a demon god, uh, for the shed blood of innocence. It makes sense because chaos, disorder, and a rampage of sin has come into uh, God's, what was God's order. This is why it's so important that we not just agree mentally with God's ways to appear to be righteous, but that we actually live intentionally the way he directs us to live. In this way, we can not only experience God's cosmos in our own lives, his order, his orderly arrangement in our own lives, but also cause his order to enter the world through us as the conduits that we are from God to the world and into other people and other situations. Wouldn't it be nice to bring life to people rather than more death? I'm close for tonight at that point uh, with that with that question. Wouldn't it be nice to be a conduit of life to this world, to the sin sick world, instead of more death through um through sin? I think it would be. And I and I really have kind of a mission statement to do that. I asked God once and well more than once if he would work through me to minister through me. I do that when I teach. Let's bring God's orderly arrangement to a chaotic world and a disordered world and into disordered lives. The reason people um, are messed up, the reason people turn to us for um, ministry is the same reason we did it, because they are disorderly and their lives are chaotic and a lot of them are overrun with sin. And we get a chance to bring God's order into that chaos and let him do his thing. Let God put order back. And when it happens, I was listening to a video that on uh, um, Tanya Bruton, one of the people I pastor gave me today. It was a former practicing witch just quoting from the word of God. She's so full of life and so spiritually clean. Um, her life was chaotic. She was worshiping the devil through witchcraft and she now represents the kingdom of God and was bringing order into the idea of why do we allow our kids to worship Satan for one night of the year uh, by practicing Halloween. It was powerful. It was really powerful. And um, just I was watching it and it was just beautiful to see um, to see the order. And also I saw a former ISIS terrorist weeping because God touched his heart and told him uh, he, he forgave him. And the order of the Lord went into the soul of someone who thought it was wonderful to kill Christians and Jews and other Arabs that didn't agree with them. This is the re this is the only way for there to really be peace in the Middle East. It's for Jesus to touch the hearts of people. Well, I'm done for the night. Let's pray, and then we'll have some um, notes. Father, I thank you so much for the people who take time to be a part of our Bible study and come and spend time, and it's humbling to know that they care to do that. And I appreciate that. And I ask you to bless them and uh, give them good nights. I pray that the things that we talked about today um, will uh, touch our hearts, that will make a difference in our everyday lives, and that we will uh, pray the prayers that we talked about and ask you to draw near to us and so we can, we can experience reconciliation with you um, and experience something and receive something that we've spiritually gotten a long time ago. I thank you for the great questions tonight and I ask you to be with us. 
I asked you to be with my friend Seneca, uh, who has uh, got a wicked bad case, COVID, and is recovering at home. I asked you to be with others who are ill for various reasons. And I asked you to be with those who are um, on the brink of getting a much better job. I know a couple people like that. And I ask you to do that and bless them. And uh, I ask you to um, to be with them. And I thank you for that. In um, Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, this video will be uploaded later at this link. Uh, I also have articles here. Articles here. I, I praise God. My voice is holding up pretty good. I got another hour on the radio to do in a minute. Um, this is how you get to our radio show. TruthSeekerTexasRadio.com. You can always call in and... Um, be a part of the show, um, so that's kind of cool, and um, and I'll give you that phone number if you want it. Um, I, po I posted it on my my link earlier. Um, if you want to call in, that's the call in number. Write it down um, because I talk too fast on the radio sometimes. And today I'm going to be talking about um, the reason for discipleship. And it's a rather long teaching, so I'm going to be moving pretty quick. And I'm uh, going to start in 12 minutes. Uh, I appreciate you guys. I love you. And um, um, those of you that I haven't seen in a while, I'd like to get together with you. I really enjoy uh, visiting with people. So God bless you. And um, I love you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.